Hey, are you waiting on God to do something or to show up in some way in your life? If you've followed Jesus for more than a few minutes, then probably your answer to that question is yes. There's probably situations or circumstances you're traveling through or navigating, and you can't wait for him to break through. You can't wait for the sun to rise. And then in big picture, if you believe in Jesus, we're all waiting for his return. And we're hopeful and anticipating that it is soon because the more we look at our world and the situations of our culture and our society, it it lines up perfectly with everything that God said, everything that Jesus said would be in the last days. So we're going to talk today about waiting and how that waiting for Jesus itself is a joy and can be a source of hope and celebration and uh, delight in our lives. I'm Pastor Kerry. Thanks for joining me. This is the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel, and we are today in Psalm 130. We're finishing Psalm 130 today, and so I invite you to join me there. On Mondays and Tuesdays, we're doing the one-year Bible journey. Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, we're slow walking through Psalms. Saturday, we're doing the Gospel of John. And on Sundays, we will soon resume our series on the family, uh, family matters, eight habits of happy homes. So a lot going on, and there's a lot of playlists, a lot of material here on the channel. Five, I think 500 videos now, and uh, many of you have been taking this journey with me every day, or for now a year or more. And I'm so thankful that you have. Now I got to tell you, I'm back from a three-week break. So um, this particular video. I, I haven't recorded in a while. The things you've been watching the last couple of weeks, I recorded ahead of time. Um, and uh, I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. I didn't want to fall behind in our journey in many of these respects. So I put a lot of extra work in before break to, uh, to get those videos recorded so that you could continue to be encouraged. And, uh, and yet now I'm back and we're resuming. And I just want to say many of you knew that I was on a break and you were praying for me and for our family. We had a great time. When you're in the ministry, and I guess this is true no matter what you're doing for a vocation in life, trying to get a break sometimes um, can be a difficult thing because um, there are a lot of disruptors and a lot of things, especially in a large church and a large in a large ministry, and I'm not complaining. It's amazing joy and opportunity and privilege that I have. So you get no complaints out of me. Uh, but the last couple of years, we had a sabbatical a couple of years ago. And the last couple of years, every time we've tried to take a break, something has disrupted it, some crisis or some situation, or even uh, one one time an entire week of sickness. So uh, I really came into this one, first of all, wanting it, needing it, feeling like uh, we were ready to crash a little bit. And, uh, and just asking God to give us a smooth break uh, with minimal disruptions, and he did by his grace. So we're thankful for that. It was so much fun. We had a good time with our kids and grandkids for a couple of weeks, um, all of us together, and enjoying um, the beaches of North Carolina and uh, the donut shops and the restaurants and long walks, and it was, it was good. Now, the humidity I can do without, the 95-degree temperatures I could do without, and mostly the bug bites I can do without. My goodness, I got eaten alive. But anyway, I love North Carolina, and uh, we were down not far from Wilmington, and we enjoyed that time. And then Dana and I took some time uh, after that. We sent all the kids and family home, and we drove south to Florida, and we spent uh, a few more days together alone and then made the long drive from uh, central Florida all the way up the East Coast to Connecticut. So we're back. We're back home. We're excited to be. I'm looking forward to this weekend in church. If you're a part of our church family, we'll be resuming our study of uh, of the, the the family series, Family Matters. And I'm so excited about what's on schedule for this weekend. So enough of that. Thank you for the preliminaries. Thank you for hanging with me. Let's go to God's word for the next few minutes. And I want to read together this psalm because, again, it's been a few weeks since I've uh, been in it, this particular psalm. But what a great psalm this is. This is eight verses. We've been taking it basically two or three verses at a time. And um, this is, again, to remember, Song of Ascent or Song of Degrees. This is the pilgrimage psalms that the Israelites would sing on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate, to feast, to bring their atonement offerings and their free will offerings and their celebration offerings. And they would feast together. So it was an anticipatory thing to journey to Jerusalem with your family, with your village, together, families of families, uh, tribes of, and, and villages of families. 
and together a giant family reunion in Jerusalem, the city of God, to enjoy his presence, to enjoy um, the family of Israel. And so they would sing these songs in anticipation. It was a teaching mechanism. They were singing them with their kids. They're teaching and training their kids. It was an entire ecosystem, an entire culture oriented around God, oriented around the gospel of his forgiving, redeeming grace, and then his nurturing, uh, cultivating relationship of transforming and leading them forward in the purposes that he's ordained for them and in the joys that he's prepared for them. And this is to a degree what I'm going to be preaching about on Sunday, and we get to see it kind of in the song and in the Psalms of Ascent that the culture of their lives was oriented around God, and that involved reconcile, being reconciled to God first, and then it involved growing up in God, and then it involved enjoying God, and then it involved serving, doing God's ministry, doing his purpose, and finding meaning in his mission for our lives. Now, these big values, we're going to talk about on Sunday, are still what drive our lives today as we know God. And they're still the things we're the most hungry for and the most seeking deeply, Most our souls most long for these things. And we only find them in a redeemed, reconciled relationship with God as we move forward with him. So as these songs of ascent were sung, this is the one they sang, Psalm 130. Let's read it together. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. This is where we're picking it up today. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So in big picture, we we said this a couple days ago, but I'll say it one more time. Um, Warren Wearsby broke this psalm down into four parts and really four locations. And they're locations that are inferred to, not directly referred to you. They're here, you'll see them. They're four different locations that the psalmist, the author of the psalm is taking us to four different places. And he's relating his relationship with God to these four locations. So the first location is the grave. Out of the depths have I cried to thee, O Lord. So knowing God, being saved through Jesus brings me from death to life, verses one and two, from death to life. God hears our cry and he brings us to life. He brings us out of the grave. This is the gospel embedded in the Old Testament. And we saw that yesterday. Second position or second place is the courtroom. This is verses three and four. If you should mark iniquities, who shall stand? Now now God's, in one case, God is a resurrecting savior. In the next case, he is a forgiving judge. If you mark iniquities, I'm, I'm in big trouble. But with you, verse 4, there's forgiveness that you may be feared or lovingly revered. So the second location, not just the grave, but the courtroom. And salvation with God through Jesus moves us not just from death to life, but from guilt to forgiveness. We stand forever perpetually forgiven in the grace of God. You say, can I lose it? No, you can never lose it. It's a condition. It's a qualitative, confirmed, conferred, objective reality. You are not good because you're behaving well. You're good because God calls you good. You're not forgiven because you deserve it. You're forgiven because Jesus paid the price on the cross. So forgiveness is free for us, but it was costly for Jesus. It's easy for us, but it was difficult for Jesus. He did the hard work, and there's no work left to do for us. We receive it as a gift, and we are free to run in the grace and the unconditional love of God. We're fully made alive, forgiven, and accepted in him as a part of his family. So from the grave to the courtroom, in the grave we're brought to life. In the courtroom we're declared innocent. The third location, this one is a little bit more inferred, 
is the walls of the city. I talked about this yesterday. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait in his uh, wait. And I'm sorry. Uh, let me back up here and make sure I get this right. Yes, my soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. So the watch, the idea of watching was a guard standing on the walls of the city and at strategic places all the way around the city and, of course, protecting from danger and warning the inhabitants if there was danger coming. But the watchman was anticipating the sunrise. The sunrise made the city much less vulnerable safety. And so we could say it's this way. On the city walls, in this position, we move from darkness to light. You could also say it this way. We move from danger to imminent danger to perpetual, eternal, infinite safety. So darkness to light, danger to safety because of the watchman who's waiting on the walls. And then verses seven and eight, look at it. Let Israel hope in the Lord for with the Lord, there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. Now we have to think a little deeper on this one. Again, the depth, that's, that's pretty easy to see the grave there. Um, forgiveness and marking iniquities, it's pretty easy to see the courtroom there. Uh, watching for the morning, unless you understand ancient culture and the city walls, that might not be so obvious that it, we're talking about a watchman on the walls. But this one is even a little more subtle, and this is how Hebrew poetry is. So let's think more deeply here. Let Israel hope. So this is a hopeless condition. But now there's hope. Hope is entered in. Hope, hopelessness to hope. For with the Lord there is mercy. So this is still a guilty condition, but now there's mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. And the word shows up again, and he shall redeem. Redemption. Now this is the this is the real key, okay? This is the um, this is the key that unlocks the location. Redemption in a biblical lens is to buy back from bondage or to buy back from slavery. And so we're moving in the gospel and in the grace and love of Jesus, we're moving from bondage to freedom. So what is the location? It's most likely prison, debtor's prison, guilt prison, criminal prison. I'm in prison. I'm in bondage. I'm enslaved. It could be a position of slavery, but the idea here is we're moving from bondage to freedom. So four locations, the grave, Jesus moves me from death to life. The courtroom, Jesus moves me from guilt to forgiveness. The walls, Jesus moves me from danger to safety and from darkness to light. And the prison, Jesus moves me from bondage and guilt to freedom and justification, redemption. I've been bought back. I'm valuable to God. And he uh, declares me valuable. I am his treasure. And what was I bought back with? I was bought back with the precious blood of Jesus, the suffering of the Son of God. And if God spared not his only Son, how much more shall he not give us all things? He's the God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He's the God of all grace. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from him, from our Father who loves us so much. So this this psalm is so much gospel. And I want you to go back in your mind now to these families journeying to Jerusalem, singing this song, teaching their children how to have a relationship with God based on being brought from death to life, based on being moved from guilt to forgiveness, based on being moved from danger to safety and darkness to light, and based on being declared free from bondage through mercy. This is all gospel. Now, I want to focus in as we close out today on verses five and six on waiting. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. And I want to speak specifically. Let's look at verse six too. My soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. Built into verses five and six is patience, endurance, but patience and endurance with a positive reality to it, a delightful reality to it, a joyful reality to it. Do you know Christians or are you a Christian that your joy is only in what will be? Can I tell you that God wants you to joy in what is? He wants you to celebrate now. 
He doesn't only want you to celebrate what will be or what is coming or the fact that he is going to soon return and call us home. He doesn't only want you to rejoice in what will be. And I realize that's a huge part of our joy. This is the blessed hope, Titus calls it, and it is a huge source of our joy. But what about today? Is your life dominated by joy, by hope? But is it energized by delight in the Lord? Because that's what these last four verses are. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there's mercy and there's redemption, and he shall, there's the future, he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So yeah, God is going to do something, and we will be eternally celebrating the things that God is yet to do in our lives. But you know what I want to call your attention to today is that there's joy in the waiting. There's not just endurance. It's not just gritting your teeth and suffering in anguish through. There's joy. I was thinking this past week about the truth that some of the most joyful and encouraging believers I know are those who have suffered and are suffering the most. But they've turned their suffering into joyful waiting. They've turned their suffering into delight, delightful dependence in the grace and the mercy of God. They've turned their suffering. They've let, they've let the desert of their suffering drive them to the oasis of the living water of Jesus. And they drink from that living water every day. And the comfort of God and the grace of God is so abundant in their lives through their suffering that it overflows out of them. And they become, like Jesus said, a wellspring of water that's overflowing from their suffering, from their hardship, from their misery. It's, they're gushing with joy and delight and grace and mercy and abundant blessing of others. They're the happiest people I know. And the contrast is so unusual. The contrast of that is that some of the believers that I know that have the fewest troubles, the least amount of suffering, the greatest abundance, the biggest homes, the most material things, the least amount of struggles, and it seems like life is just all falling in line for them, sometimes they're the most complaining. They're the most murmuring. They're the most discontented and the most unhappy people I know. Their life is always anguish. Their life is always turmoil. It's always stress and anxiety. Even though they don't really have very much suffering or misery, they're healthy, they're strong, they're financially provided for, their family is stable, their life is moving forward. It's like, what do you what do you really have to complain about? Um, so the contrast of those who really have something to complain about, but just refuse to do so because they're overflowing with joy and delight while they wait in the grace and the comfort of God. Up against those that seem to have nothing to complain about, but can never find something to rejoice over, it is such a contrast. I want to challenge you today to take Psalm 130 and to make it your meditation again for today and over the weekend. And think about these words, I will wait, or I do wait, for the Lord. This is an active, engaged, joyful, hopeful, delightful, enduring. I am moving forward with the Lord. My soul is waiting on him and I'm hoping in his word. This is the qualitative uh, culture of my heart and life. I am hoping in God. I am joying in God. I am anticipating the dawn. My soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I'm not going to be happy only when it happens. I'm going to be happy until it happens. I'm going to be joyful until it happens. Verse 7, let Israel, let this be, the whole family, the whole tribe, the whole gathering of tribes, let all of the nation, this includes you and me, okay, we've been grafted in if we know Jesus as Savior. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there's mercy. What do you, how do you think God feels about you? Well, guess what? He feels merciful about you. He feels uh, loving about you. He feels anticipating your soon redemption and your invitation into his presence forever. He loves you and you can rejoice and joy in that love and grace and comfort. He is plentiful, plenteous in redemption. His redemption for you is abundant, and he will ultimately finish that work of redemption. So we have, on our worst days, in our most difficult situations, in the heaviest of seasons, we have a lot 
to rejoice over. We have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot of good news that holds us together called the gospel. Now, let me finish with this. If we read this psalm, and if I asked you, do you know Jesus this way? Let me say it simply. Are you trying to work your way into a salvation, into the salvation of God? Are you trying to be good enough to earn it? Maybe you know that you're guilty in your sin and you're trying to pay it off. You're trying to work your way there by being religious. And I want to warn you, my friend, that is a system of works and it is not true biblical salvation because good works, religiosity, ceremony, tradition, morality, generosity, charity, it never saves us. These things do not save us. There's value in living a good life and in good behavior and in morality and charity and all these things. There's value in it all. But it doesn't save us. It doesn't atone for our sins. So the only way to know God, the only way to be redeemed or reconciled to God is not through my church or through my good works. It's through Jesus. Why? Because he's the one who went to the grave for me so that I could be resurrected from the grave. He's the one that sat in the seat of the guilty in the courtroom of heaven and he took my guilt to the cross so that I could be declared forgiven. He's the one that stands on the walls of the city and guards and watches and protects and brings me from darkness to light and from danger to safety. He is the guard of my salvation and the God of my salvation. And then he's the one that when I was in prison and in bondage, gave his life to redeem me, to buy me back out of slavery to buy me back out of prison. He paid my debts so that I could be adopted and brought into his family. And if you've never received this, you cannot achieve it, but you can receive it, excuse me. If you have never received it, then I invite you to do so right now. Bow your head and heart in the privacy of wherever you are and say, Jesus, it is not by my works that I'm saved, but it is by yours. And right now I'm asking you to be my personal savior. I'm asking you to come into my life and save me by your grace and by your mercy. I'm trusting you and no one else and nothing else. You alone are my savior. That is the decision of faith to receive the gift of God, of salvation. And now you can declare You can celebrate with these in this psalm and with all of the rest of us on this channel and in this family. I have moved from the grave, from death to life. I have moved in the courtroom from guilt to forgiveness. I have moved on the city walls from darkness to light. The sun has risen from danger to safety. I have moved from my prison cell of bondage into the freedom of new life in Jesus. And that is the beauty of Psalm 130. Wow. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this has blessed and encouraged you. I'm praying for you all. I will see you next time. Don't forget to join us this weekend tomorrow for the Gospel of John Sunday for Family Matters. Have a great day.